Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our prosthodontic series. This video will serve as a general overview of the shade selection process. There are a lot more details on this topic, so this is meant to cover just the high yield facts for the board exam. So the first thing I want to talk about is the Munsell color system. And this color system has three main components, that being hue, chroma, and value. And all three of those are really important to know for the board exam. So the hue describes the color family. So is the color a red? Is it a blue? Is it a green? And so on. Basically where on the color wheel that particular color is. The chroma is defined as the saturation or intensity of color. So is it a dull grayish blue or is it a more vibrant and pure blue? Basically how close or far from the center of the color wheel it is. And then lastly, value is the lightness or darkness of that color. And when it comes to shade selection for a crown, this is the most important trait of the three. So the value is basically, is it a light or a dark version of that color? How up or down on the sliding bar of the color wheel is it? And this is measured from zero, which would be pure black, to 100, which would be pure white. And then anywhere in the middle would be some colored variant, either light if we're headed towards 100, or a dark version of the color if we're headed towards zero. So that's hue, chroma, and value in a nutshell. But we also have the effect of light. And the light source that we're using when color matching or shade matching is also incredibly important. So I want to talk about these three concepts related to how light can influence how we perceive color. So the first is metamerism. And this is the phenomenon that color appears different under different lighting. In other words, the same object can appear different colors under different lights. This image shows the same objects in direct sunlight, indirect sunlight, and artificial light. And the same thing happens when we're shade matching crowns. The actual color of the natural teeth and of the crown we're selecting is, can be vastly different depending on the light that we're using to illuminate the oral cavity. So this 5500K or 5500 Kelvin refers to color temperature. A lower temperature has a reddish hue, whereas a higher temperature has a more bluish hue. And 5500 is right in the middle, which is perfectly white light, like you'd see at noon in natural daylight. And CRI refers to the color rendering index, which measures a light's ability to illuminate different colors using a number from 0 to 100%. And 100% color rendering index means you'll get the best color extraction from an object possible. So although perfectly white light is the ideal light source for shade matching, as long as you're staying consistent in your light source for shade matching, you can get accurate results. So the important thing to take away here is that we want to stay consistent in our light source. The next phenomenon I want to talk about is fluorescence, which describes how an object can emit visible light when exposed to ultraviolet light. So you might notice this if you're um, maybe at a bowling alley or a roller skating rink where they have the UV light and your some object, maybe a white sock or a shoe or something lights up. That's basically the phenomenon of fluorescence in, um, in action. So this can happen to a composite shade. So if you're, uh, you have a composite filling, you can actually identify it with UV light. And it could appear to match the tooth color in natural light, but as soon as you shine some UV light on it, the composite can have this different fluorescent ability. It's actually a very clinically, it's very clinically applicable because if you have a small piece of composite, maybe you were bonding on an ortho bracket or using some bonded attachment, and you want to know where to remove it, 
and if you have any left on the tooth surface, you can actually shine some UV light on the tooth to illuminate that composite. So a material with better fluorescent ability will tend to match tooth color more closely. So fluorescence is yet another important uh, influence that light can have on our color perception. And the last of these is opalescence. And this refers to the light effect of a translucent material appearing blue in reflected light and red-orange in transmitted light. So the light that reflects from an object appears blue, or is the light that goes through that object or transmits through it appears more orange-red in hue. So basically, shorter wavelengths like blue light scatter within the tooth, whereas longer wavelengths like red light pass through it. And this is an ideal trait to make something appear more translucent, like the incisal edge of an incisor, because the incisal edge is naturally translucent due to the fact that only enamel is present in that region of the tooth. So if you're trying to make the incisal edge of a crown look more translucent, you would employ opalescence. Okay, so we talked about those three concepts, and we already talked about hue, chroma, and value. So let's put it all together. Let's say we're shade selecting and trying to match the shade of the natural teeth with a crown that we're fabricating. So you actually want to look for the value first. And so the value, as we said, is the most important feature of shade matching. And so we want to pick that first. So this is typically found in the middle third of a crown. You can hone in on the value most accurately in this region of the tooth. You'd pick the chroma second, and that's typically concentrated in the cervical third of the crown. This is a little bit of an overgeneralization, but just for sticking to the high yield facts, that's how I think of it. And you focus on hue last, that's actually the least important characteristic, and that's mostly concentrated in the incisal third of the crown. The most important thing of this slide is the order in which we select and shade match these qualities from most important to least important. Okay, characterization refers to reproducing natural defects on a crown. So a tooth, a natural tooth, isn't just one blank shade of white without any sort of characteristics or, or defects, we could say. So we want to reproduce those defects to make a crown appear more natural in the mouth. So some ways we can do that is through staining, which is applying some different color stains to the crown. This results in the loss of fluorescence and increases metamerism, and it also usually decreases value. So decreasing value means you're making something darker. Adding a complementary color to a crown, something like an orange tint, will decrease the value or make that crown appear darker. So we should differentiate this from the glazing process. Glazing means that surface layers of the porcelain melt slightly, coalescing particles and filling in defects. So glazing is more about treating the surface texture rather than affecting the color. But the texture is also important in creating a crown that appears more natural. So we also want to have defects in that area. So to put all this together, you can always add more color and make something darker, but not the reverse. So in other words, you can always decrease value by adding more stain. But the same can't be said for the other direction. You can't make things lighter, and you can't take away color. So when in doubt, pick a shade with a lower saturation, or less chroma, and less darkness, or a higher value, because we can always go back and add color, add stain, and make the crown darker later on. All right, so if we put it all together in the context of delivering a crown to the patient, inserting it in the mouth, we want to do these things in this general order. The first thing we want to do when we get a crown back from the lab is to check the shade and aesthetics. 
This is actually a really good boards question. They may just ask flat out, what's the first thing you do when you get a crown back from the lab? And he wants to confirm that the shade is what you selected with the patient. Then from here, you check the proximal contacts, both on the cast and in the patient's mouth. The reason why you check this first is that if a proximal contact is not present, the contact is open, well, you have to send that crown back for it to be adjusted because having an open space between the crown and the adjacent tooth will leave a food impaction site, which means food will constantly get caught in there, which is a treatment failure. Additionally, if the proximal contact is too strong or too heavy, the crown won't seat all the way, and it needs to be adjusted until we can seat it fully and then we can check all of these other, these other features. Say if we tried to check occlusion first and it was occluding very high, but it wasn't seating all the way and we adjust occlusion, we get the crown to seat all the way and now it's not occluding at all. So we have to do, certainly check the proximal contacts first and make sure this, the crown is seating all the way. Next we would check the margins. So you want to check that the margin of the crown meets the margin of the prep, just like a cap on a marker. You want to check that it has good fit, that the prep has good retention and resistance form, the crown has adequate occlusion, and that the crown is contoured anatomically. If everything looks good, you can cement first with temporary cement and then reassess, because once you cement with permanent cement, that crown's really not going to come off unless you cut it off. So we'll talk about in the next video all the different kinds of permanent and temporary cements that we can use to place a crown. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you're interested in supporting me, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja and all of my patrons for their continued support. You can unlock things like access to my video slides if you want to take notes on them, and practice questions. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thank you for watching, everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.